The following interview is conducted with Donald E. Bergstrom, Professor Emeritus of Medicinal Chemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, May 30th, 2012 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, Professor Emeritus of Library Science and the former Oral History Library. And good morning and good afternoon again, sir. Let's start, uh, tell me a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay, I was born in Tacoma, Washington, and that was October 9, 1943. Okay, uh, parents and siblings um, in so early years? Yes. Uh, <laughs> my, daughter, my, my father was uh, in construction and engineer. In fact, I think the year I was born, he was working for Boeing. Okay. Um, he was a designer on parts for the D-17. Okay. And yeah. go ahead. But yeah, he was a, like I say, he was working on parts at Boeing B seventeen in in Seattle, um, Washington. Okay. And um, my mom, uh, she mainly stayed home, but she did work part time in a candy factory. Ooh, that was good for <laughs> the children. <laughs> well, I don't Sam know. I don't remember that we ate candy. I don't know that we were allowed to. But. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, tell us. Um, go ahead. I had an older brother. He was about two years older than I am. And, and what about uh, early school and then uh, your or grade school and then move on? We'll talk after that about high school. Did you go to grade school? Well, what sort of information is best? What information do you like to well, hear? Well, uh, what was grade school? Was it small? Um, was it close to where you lived? Anything special that you kind of remember about grade school? Well, I remember uh, first, or, or kindergarten, and at that point we lived in Richland, Washington, because my father was working on a project at the Hanford uh, nuclear plant. Um, and uh, I just recalled enjoying school. Okay. Was, and it, was it a large, large school? Was your class large? I, I think it was a, quite a small school. Okay. But, All righty. Um, well, let's move on. Let's, let's tell us about uh, high school, where you went, and your, some of your teachers and the courses and students at student organizations, etc. Well, during high school, I lived in Kirkton, Washington, which is just north of Bellevue. People know Bellevue better because that's where Microsoft is located. <laughs> uh, it's on the east side of Lake Washington. Uh, Lake Washington borders of Seattle, so mm -hmm. it's close to Seattle. I went to a high school called Lake Washington Senior High School, and our mascot was the kangaroo. And uh, I was uh, mostly interested in science. I had uh, exceptional physics and chemistry teacher, two two different teachers, <laughs> and I still remember the names. Mr. Willard was my physics teacher, and Mr. Hansen was my chemistry teacher, and they were very, very influential in my decision to go into science when I went to college. Very good. It's interesting. Uh, others have shared the same same thing. They remember the names, and one other comment is that many times they'll say, they always put Mr. in front of the name or Miss, whatever. It's interesting. <laughs> that <laughs> seems to be the way. we called them. Yeah, that's the way yeah. we called them, exactly. <laughs> um, what, was, uh, was it a large uh, high school that you went to? It was a high school of, I think, maybe uh, 400 to 500 students, so it was fairly large. Good. Okay. All righty. Um, then uh, I know then from then you decided you, just, you felt that you wanted to go to college, and how did you make your selection uh, where you went? Well, I lived quite close to the University of Washington, and it was within commuting distance. Okay. So uh, for the first year, we were able to simply drive to school. Okay. Well, tell us a little about college life. And you, then you lived. You didn't live on campus. Then did you live on campus? I did. So after the first year, um, let's see. After the first year, uh, I lived on campus uh, one year for my sophomore year, uh, and stayed in the dorm. So I had that experience. But then uh, our family moved to Seattle within walking distance of the University of Washington. So oh. my last two years, I was actually able to uh, walk to. Class. Wow, that's wonderful. What about, yes. what was your course of study and any professors that um, you recall working pretty closely with? Well, so um, my first year, 
um, I took lots of different courses because even though I was interested in science, I wanted to try different things. I even took art courses. Sounds good. Uh, good background. And, anthropology, <laughs> lots of English courses, uh, and lots of math. So, uh, but by the end of my first year, I decided to be a chemistry major and a math minor. Okay, sounds good. Okay. What about... And uh, I do remember, um, particularly in my second year uh, of college, sophomore year, when I started uh, organic chemistry, I had some exceptional teachers. Uh, one, of the, one whose name was uh, Dr. Parker, and he also was very influential. I did extremely well on the course, and so decided in my sophomore year to do research. And so I joined the laboratory of Hip Dalbin um, in my sophomore year, and I started research early. Very good. You got got in on the ground floor. I did. Right, yeah. Any clubs that you joined while you were uh, in college? I don't recall in okay. college. In high school, I was actually president of the science club in very, high school. Very good. Very I good. forgot to mention that. Uh, okay, sounds good. What was the camp? What was campus life like? It was. Pre it's a pretty large, large university, isn't it? Well, so it, sure. it's a very large university. Sure. Uh, in fact, like right, very large, just about exactly the same size as Purdue. Oh. <laughs> okay. So. Whatever the experiences people have at Purdue, I think were similar to what I had. Um, I think because I lived at home three of my four years, uh -huh. I was less engaged in campus life than sure. some students. Sure. And yeah. my circle of friends was strictly within the realm of the chemistry department. And we did lots of things uh, together. Um, but I don't recall uh, any specific uh, club activities and so on that I was engaged in. Right. Okay. Okay, after um, college, what uh, you went on to grad? Did you go to grad school? Well, tell so us after college. I mentioned I was working for Hip Dalbin doing research. Okay. And uh, I started applying to graduate schools, and Hip Dalbin came in uh, as I do my applications, and I was applying. In fact, I think at that stage I'd already been accepted and had a full scholarship to go to uh, University of Colorado. And Hip Dalbin said, No, 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 you can't go there. You can only go to Harvard or Berkeley. And so wow. I thought that was good. And so I ended up going to University of California, Berkeley. He made sure, and I, fairly, he must have written me a good recommendation because sure. I got accepted. Good, wonderful. Uh, how, was, how, did, how did you enjoy, um, how was Berkeley for you? Did, you? did you enjoy it? No, that was probably one of the greatest experiences of my life, being at Berkeley. I was at Berkeley uh, in the late 1960s. So oh. I was there at the same time there was all of the campus uprisings around the country. Not that I engaged in those campus uprisings. But they were but going on. They were going on, so, you know, I could uh, sure. walk out on the balcony of my lab while I'm doing experiments and watch the smoke rising from the tear gas. Wow. So. Around here it was known as the unrest. <laughs> I see, okay. <laughs> oh, well, did you ever serve in the military, sir? I did not. Okay. I, I remember very vividly going to uh, the local um, military facility for a physical exam sure but i think at that time they had the lottery numbers oh and they okay. picked numbers okay and it turned out for my birth date uh, i had a number that was very high so i had friends that um, were inducted into the armed services out of graduate school but i was not one of them oh okay all righty but at least you can't pass the physical so you're okay <laughs> yeah all righty let's talk a little bit about your career path before you came to purdue uh, which I believe was in 1989 you came to Purdue? I came to 89, yes. Okay, to Purdue. okay. Well, tell us a little about what, uh, just some highlights or something you'd like to share with us before you came to Purdue. Well, I went to lots of different places. I had a couple of postdoctoral experiences. Okay. I went to the University of Illinois um, to work with Nelson Leonard in the Department of Chemistry. Mm -hmm. And that's where I was introduced to nucleic acid chemistry. Uh, and... Uh, that's a field I stuck to for the rest of my career. Good. Okay. So he was very influential. Good. Uh, after two years with him, I went to Rockefeller University in New York mm. and uh, worked in a completely different area to learn something else. So I learned photochemistry at Rockefeller University. Okay. Okay. And uh, we lived in an apartment on 66th in New York, and it was a six-floor walk-up. Oh. And we had two small children at that point. I got married... Uh, 
just as I was graduating from Berkeley, by the way, in 1970. Oh, okay. Did you meet your wife there in California? I, I did. I met, she was a, a gra an undergraduate at uh, UC Berkeley. Oh, okay. Well, I was a graduate student. Good. Okay. Well, that was an experience in New York with a walk-up. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You, well, you never lose, you always remember that. <laughs> we uh, certainly do. Yeah. After Rockefeller, what, what came next? Well, so then I spent a few years at University of California, Davis, teaching organic chemistry. And uh, let's say stayed there through 79. Then I moved to uh, University of North Dakota and spent nine years there on the faculty in the chemistry department. Okay. Uh, yeah. Both teaching and research. Right, okay. You continued on in your research that you sort of started at Illinois. I did. I was actually quite successful getting grants, uh, right. both starting at UC Davis, University of California Davis, and that continued on at North Dakota. Okay. Um, and it was because of these grants that I started uh, participating in grant reviews in Washington, D.C., and it was in one of these grant reviews that I served along with C.J. Chang, who was on the faculty of medicinal chemistry, and um, then um, because of him and because I met the chairman of the department, Steve Byrne, then, at a meeting, they invited me to come to Purdue for an interview. They liked the research I was doing, and that led to a job offer. Very nice. And so the next move was Boilermaker Country, right? It, it absolutely was. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell us, when initially, did you do any teaching when you first came, or did you continue more in the research area? Tell us um, when you both. came. Okay. Teaching, uh, so I taught organic chemistry and freshman chemistry at uh, University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, uh -huh. and so I continued teaching organic chemistry when I came to Purdue. Okay, and you came in the Department of Molecular uh, uh, Medicinal, medicinal chemistry. chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology? That's right. It had a different name then. Yeah, I know. I know. Things change. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, tell us a little bit about your research uh, areas, of which you've got several. Um, I'll leave it up to you how you would like to, to talk a little bit about that. Okay, most of my research has been in the area of uh, nucleic acid chemistry. Okay. And that's an area that I mentioned I was introduced to when I was a postdoc with Nelson Leonard at uh, University of Illinois. And I continued on in that area. And uh, when I was um, actually at University of California, Davis, I made a number of discoveries um, that involved ways to change nucleic acid structure so that you could do assays. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the chemistry we developed led to the techniques for sequencing DNA. And of course, sequencing DNA uh, has been in the news uh, because there's a lot of interest in medicine in sequencing the entire human genome as a predictor for various disease states. Okay, all right, okay. So you continued on with that. Did you, uh, you. one of the things that I saw, and I may have put this in the, you, uh, some antiviral uh, agent design, were you doing something along that line too? We did. So okay. uh, that was particularly while we were at University of North Dakota, mm -hmm. where we designed antiviral agents. And okay. we developed some very active compounds that actually went into trials in monkeys. Okay. And uh, that continued, that research continued on for about 10 years. But what I found was that as we made discoveries, drug companies would then put many people on projects and they were much faster making new compounds than we were. Okay. So they would use our technology, uh, but it was clear that uh, we couldn't compete with them as far as drug development. Sure. And we said, that's fine, that's not what we're here for. We're here, in fact, to come up with new knowledge that then allows them to make drugs, and that was exactly what was happening. Yeah. So we made important contributions to the technologies they then used to develop new drugs that eventually made it to a clinic. Okay. Um, Go ahead. And so, so uh, when I made the transition to Purdue, um, my research focused more than on developing tools, and not only tools for developing drugs, but tools for biochemists and molecular biologists so that they could study and understand uh, DNA and mm -hmm. RNA. Okay. Right. 
All right. And you did some interdisciplinary because you're working with, um, I mentioned you were working with a couple people in civil and also in vet med. So I that's did. the focus is, you know, there's been more of this interdisciplinary over the number, most recent years. So that was throughout my whole career, in fact, that uh, okay. early on we were interdisciplinary because we were working with virologists. So okay. as we were developing antiviral compounds, uh, we would have our compounds screened by virologists and also by biochemists. So we were the people that made tools, the compounds, and then the biologists would use those to study their uh, systems to understand how the biochemistry worked. I see. Okay. The, how, how was the funding in those in your in the days, particularly after you came to Purdue? How'd the funding come? Uh, internal, it, external? Did it continue so external, on? Yeah, no, it continued on. So, Good. but we were continually changing uh, our approach uh, and continually had new ideas. So, one of the first grant proposals that I wrote when I got to Purdue actually was stimulated by talking with someone in the biochemistry department. And this one, this person, uh, Philip Andrews, who since moved on to uh, Michigan, um, he was explaining the problem they had in sequencing uh, DNA. And it allowed me to come up with the idea for what we call the universal nucleic acid base. Okay. And so we immediately wrote a proposal that proposal uh, was funded, and uh, it was continued on. So we spent about uh, 10 years or more working on that project. Oh. And actually developed a number of universal bases that are used as tools and have been commercialized. Okay, sounds good. It really really took off and did well for you. It, it did. And I was always talking, uh, engaging myself with other people, and um, I don't recall exactly how I met Chip Latchley, but I think it was through one of my postdocs. Uh -huh. And Chip Latchley, uh, in civil engineering, was working on a project to uh, try to determine the photochemical dose that microorganisms uh, get when they go through a water system that's irradiated with UV. Mm -hmm. Because you want to use UV light to disinfect water rather than having to use so many chemicals like chlorine. I see. And, and so um, what he wanted was something he could put on small beads. Where the beads would go through the water system, they would be exposed to the UV light, and then he could capture the beads after they go through, and he could look at the beads and, say, by fluorescence, tell what the dose was. Mm. And so uh, it, it, I, I remember now what happened. My postdoc was happened to live in the university village, uh, and he was talking to one of his friends who worked for Chip Flashley, and uh, he heard from this friend that they needed some sort of a molecule that could change and become fluorescent when it went through the system. And my postdoc happened to ask me, and I said, Oh, sure. I made a molecule like that back in the 1970s. <laughs> and it turned out that something we had made uh, to be an antiviral compound sure. actually had the properties they needed to use on these beads for the detection system. Wonderful. How great. And so that's how we started with CHIP, and that evolved into a project that, that worked quite well. Oh, isn't, that's nice to hear. I appreciate you sharing that with me. Certainly nanotechnology has made an, impa has, has made an impact on uh, the research areas for you. Oh, uh, you absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, so nanotechnology, so I would not call that a nanotechnology project, although it's close, because right. we're working with these micro bees. Sure, but right. The nanotech area, I really became involved in um, when uh, I started talking with Rashid Bashir, who was on the faculty then, he since moved to Illinois, but he was on the faculty at Purdue, uh -huh. and uh, working with trying to attach DNA to microchips, mm. silicon microchips. Okay. And since we were experts in DNA and detection systems, it's, it involved chemistry that we've been doing for years, uh, we started working with him. Okay. Very good. And that, that was a very productive collaboration, too, because we could do the chemistry to make the biomolecules. Then uh, our students would work with his students to put the biomolecules, the DNA, on the microchips, and then they would work on technologies involving imaging okay. and electronics. Very good. Work very well together, putting the hand, yep. the hands left and right going together. 
<laughs> um, it's a great collaboration. Right. Now, at one time, uh, one thing I read, you were the um, were you the associate head of the department at one time? Well, I was, okay. but that was for a very short period. Oh, okay. And uh, there were very few uh, extra duties involved with that, so I would not even put that in. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was sort of a, a in-between or something, huh? Or it, interim? It, it was. Okay. It was not important. <laughs> I mean, my involvement in the cancer center was much more important than That's that. what I'd like to move on to next, but I did want to, uh, before that, I wanted to ask you, you're the Walter professor. Uh, yes. Could you, for researchers, could you just make a comment on that, that particular title or how that came about? Well, that came about, uh, that was actually part of the deal when I came to Purdue. Okay. That they had this Walter professorship available for someone that was doing uh, cancer-focused um, research. And as we were working on antiviral compounds, we were at the same time building molecules and testing for anti-cancer activity. Okay. And so uh, when I came to Purdue, they offered me this Walther professorship that uh, involved working with the Walther Cancer Institute in Indianapolis. Okay. And, and that was a long and productive uh, collaboration. And they provided a significant amount of funding over the years for my research group. Okay. So that leads into the... So uh, with your involvement with the cancer center, so if you share, yes. let's go ahead and make some uh, share with us some information about that. Well, so with the cancer center, I, I joined immediately when I came to Purdue. Okay. And the cancer center uh, was in place probably a decade before I came. I think uh, the late 1970s it was organized. And at the time that I came to Purdue, Bill Baird was the director of the cancer center. And uh, the cancer center is divided into a number of different program areas. So the biologists are mainly in the uh, cell growth and differentiation program area. Oh, that name probably has changed by now, too. I forget what the new name is. But the names of these areas kept changing. So when I came in, they needed someone to be leader of experimental therapeutics. Okay. And that mainly involved faculty that were working on development of drugs. And so that's what I did. That was my major role throughout uh, my uh, career at Purdue was involved with the Cancer Center as a program leader. Okay. And that meant that I was working along with uh, a dozen to 15 different faculty to coordinate activities that facilitate uh, collaborations and interactions among mm -hmm. different people. Okay. Very, and, it, um, and it's grown over the years, hasn't it? The it center? has. Okay. So, uh, by 2004, uh, I started uh, working with Rashid Bashir to put together a new program. Rashid left about that time, but he helped me put together three symposia in which we brought together engineers, chemists, and biologists. And at that time, we decided we needed to integrate nanotechnology to the cancer center. Okay. So that's when we started a new program area that was in the drug delivery. Uh, area and uh, that area continued to grow from about 2006 until I left in 2000 and left. Okay. And then uh, when I left, Alex Wayne Chemistry took over the leadership of that program. Okay, all right. The funding for that, uh, a lot of it is is in grants, federal grants. Uh, does the local community give something, or I think researchers might be interested uh, if you had a comment on. Okay, good. <laughs> so all of the all above. Yeah, I first gotcha. of all, I, I think it's worth emphasizing the significance of the Purdue Cancer Center. It's now the Purdue Center for Cancer Research. It did change its they name. They changed the name, that's correct, uh, right. Right. Um, but um, two things. First of all, not only did that center work to foster a lot of collaboration, but also it is the center that allowed us to get funding from the National Cancer Institute. So that center has continually gotten funding from the National Cancer Institute since the late 1970s. Okay. And it's one of only about, I don't know how many now, it used to be seven or eight, maybe it's only three or four, maybe five, you don't have to get the number from the cancer center, of basic cancer centers in the U.S. that's an NCI designated center. And that's a very important fact to be an NCI, National Cancer Institute, NCI designated center, comes with lots of prestige. So that has brought and Purdue a lot of prestige over the years. Um, and that means having that funding to uh, help uh, foster this interaction, cancer research, um, 
to provide these uh, various technical cores that make it less expensive for people to do many different types of experiments. Sure, okay. And isn't it, let me ask you this, isn't, wasn't it unique to have a center such as that right on the campus of a university and academic rather than, yes. sep rather than say, with a medical school? And That's exactly, okay. you, you, you have, you've, done, you've done your homework. <laughs> That's exactly the case. It okay. is very unique. Right. So, um, in fact, Purdue had a cancer center long before the IU Medical School had a cancer center. Right, right. Because I've been here quite a while, and I remember when it got started. As a matter of fact, Dr. Moray caught a class, and I used to do a lot of literature searching for a number of years when I, uh, during my career with the library. And I sat in on that and gave me some good background information about the literature and things of that sort, which helped me okay. to do literature searches in the uh, National Library of Medicine database cancer line. Well, good. Okay, so perfect. it helped out. <laughs> um, a couple synergistic activities. You got quite a few patents. Did you get some of them while you were at Purdue and some before? I did. So uh, the number of patents I actually had awarded, I think, was basically only three before I got at Purdue. Okay. Uh, before, and I actually, I created a, a plot uh, right before I retired to find out the level of activity uh, in getting patents. And um, so the first project I mentioned that I worked on at Purdue, this universal base, sure. uh, we, we got two patents for that uh, the project. Good. And uh, particularly after um, I began working with Rashid Bashir and some of the other collaborations to begin filing for patents. So I think there's been 10 awarded patents since I've been at Purdue. And uh, there are many patents that are in the works. In other words, they've been submitted. Good. And they just haven't been awarded yet. So okay. uh, there's probably another seven or eight patents. I think I have 13 awarded. And there's another seven or eight that are, uh, are filed Good. that just haven't been awarded yet. Okay. You let me know because we need that for the update. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, you've also been on some editorial boards. At one time, you were the editor of the current protocols in nucleic acid chemistry. I was actually the founding editor. Oh, the founding. I, Good. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was actually the one person that started that current protocol. Uh -huh. So, and I don't remember the details how that started, but I got in discussions with Wiley, and uh, over a period of a year or so, I, I said, here's the other three people we need to round out the editorial board. And so I brought three other people on board, and we had an editorial board of four people. And it just grew and grew and grew. <laughs> now, uh, just a couple of years ago, I retired from being editor. So I'm still the founding editor, but uh, I'm no longer active. Not on the day-to-day, -day, right? Right. <laughs> okay. Um, the School of Pharmacy, one of the things, that I, did that occur while you were here when they split from the nursing and health sciences? Uh, yes. Became separate? Okay. Okay. And that was, when you came, though, it was pharmacy, nursing, and health sciences. It was. It was one group. Right. Okay. And then you had a, who was the dean when you came? Do you recall? Was that uh, um, Chip, uh, Chip uh, 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 Rutledge? Rutledge? Okay. Yes. Okay. It was. And then uh, John Pazuzzo came, and then now we have Craig C uh, Stevenson. Right. Okay. Right. The en enrollment in, in medicinal chemistry, has that increased per maybe at the graduate level, student wise, since you were at, at Purdue? You know, it actually has not. Okay. It, it stayed pretty stable. Okay. And, you know, I'm not sure exactly the reason why. Maybe because we never actually had an increase in facilities. Sure. Uh, the pharmacy building is uh, a restricted size. Yeah. And uh, there's certainly some faculty that were enhancing, but the space has never grown. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's one reason. It also depends on other factors, funding and so on. So. Sure. Uh, that's been pretty stable. Right. Uh, funding has increased, and so I think there's been some increase in that arena, but not actually in the number of students. All right, okay, all right. Were you ever a faculty fellow while you were here, Dr. Bergson? No, I was not. Oh, but you, you, were, you were aware of the program, so usually I ask people that. Some have and some have not. I was a fact right. fellow for a number of years over in Tarkington and enjoyed it very much. Uh, talk about family, um, children, and did any of them come to Purdue, or tell us a little about that. So I have three three children. Okay. And my oldest son, uh, John, uh, when we moved to Purdue in 1989, he was just graduating from high school. Okay. And so he he went to uh, Eastman School of Music and studied music composition. Oh. Good, uh, good and, school. 
Yeah, it is. And he worked as a composer, but uh, you don't make a lot of money. So he actually came back to West Lafayette uh, in the mid-1990s, maybe 96 or 97, uh-huh. and took courses in computer science at Purdue. Okay. And so that actually became his career. So that's what he does today okay. as a computer scientist. Sure, that's all right. But he's got the music in the background. <laughs> he, he does, sure. and it's very important. So, <laughs> right. um, my, my middle son, who's two years younger, did his undergraduate work at Purdue in biology. Okay. And then he went on to graduate school at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and got a Ph.D. in structural biology. Okay. And is, what is, he, is he in academe today or...? In research? No, he, he's actually in technology. He's, I, he's working for a, a small biotech startup now in San Francisco. Oh, okay. Sounds good. And he spent he spent a number of years as a consultant for McKinsey. Okay. Uh, uh, before he did that. That was good. But that's good uh, experience to have on your on your portfolio. Oh, oh, it is, because he has the ability to do all sorts of unusual things that most scientists can't do. Sure, okay. So, yeah. Sounds uh, good. And then my youngest um, a daughter, she was a number of years younger than my son, uh, she went, uh, when we moved to West Lafayette, she was just starting sixth grade. So she did uh, sixth grade, junior high, high school in West Lafayette, okay. West Lafayette High School. Okay. And then when she graduated, she went to Harvard and got a degree in chemistry. Mm, okay. And then went to medical school at Tulane and became an MD, and she's now practicing MD in, as a family practice physician. Very good. Okay. So you got somebody to call in case you need some help. Oh, and she does, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I, she has two children who are five months and two years, and she calls <laughs> me more often for help. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> um, because she lives in Portland also. Oh, that's nice. Um, any awards and honors? I know you were a fellow of the National Institute of Health. Are there any other honors that you'd like to share with us? Well, I got a, a couple uh, honors. I, I got a Sigma Xi Award when I was at the University of North Dakota. Oh, very nice. Congratulations. That's yeah, very because nice. You, you've seen them. They have them at uh, Purdue every yeah. year. Someone oh, gets But it's award, very so. prestigious. It's very nice. It was a great award. It was very nice to get that. Mm-hmm. And then I got an uh, award for creative research from the Walter Cancer Institute. Very nice. Business, so. Very nice. Congratulations again. Um, and, and finally, there was one last award that was actually quite important to me, and that was uh, every year um, Sanofi Aventis, the drug company, invites uh, five scientists in for a special symposium. Okay. And so uh, it's supposed to be the creators of new science. And so... Uh, in 2007, I got that award from them. What was the name of the organization? The, what it's you... Sanofi Aventis. It's the drug company. Oh, okay. Sanofi. Okay, great. Very nice. How about um, breast associations? I did see where you were um, the, what, the Division of Medicinal Chemistry in the American Chemical Society. Uh, you were participated in those. I was, did you? And I, I did. Okay. In fact, I think I was most active when I was at University of North Dakota, okay. when I was actually in a chemistry department. Sure, okay. And uh, I was on the national committee to create uh, workshops and symposium for uh, the national ACS meetings. And I also was a participant. I don't remember what my title was. I may have been secretary or something like that of the uh, local ACS division uh, in the Red River Valley in North Dakota. Okay, very good. Um, how about, a, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us? A favorite tradition? Of Purdue. Uh, <laughs> hmm, that's a good question. Yeah. I've never even thought about that question. Uh, what would you define Well, as a sometimes tradition? people have said, I've had different varieties. Some, the Boilermaker Special, uh, some people have commented on commencement, um, one sometimes have been here for a while. You know, the Lion Fountain, they were able to resurrect that so it does spout the water, so something like that. But if you, you want to pass on that, that's okay with me too. Yeah, well, it's just most of everything I did it was uh, centered around my department sure. or the cancer center. So the cancer center is really my tradition. That sounds good. That's very nicely said. How about an yes. out, uh, outstanding event? It doesn't have to necessarily be Purdue related. Anything that comes to mind? Sometimes you can have more than one. People say, do I have to have one? I said, no, you can have more than one. <laughs> Outstanding event. Right. Uh, hmm. 
That's a, that's a good question. Another one that I really haven't thought about. There's mm-hmm. one, I mean, if you if you want to make an outstanding event in my life, it's certainly probably uh, the birth of my children. There you go. And many have shared the same thing, and you're right along with them. <laughs> and, and then right after that is the birth of my grandchildren. <laughs> And continuing on, right? <laughs> That's okay. right. Well, I now have five grandchildren, so right. and they're all age four and younger. So well, that, that'll keep you happy. You've got that. Yeah. That's a big outstanding. <laughs> yeah. um, let's then, in closing, you know, retirement, your new stage. You want to share with us what uh, what's going on out there in Oregon? Well, a lot's going on out here. Which <laughs> good. <laughs> See, now these are the well, outstanding events. Well, I, I live. <laughs> I live basically right in the center of Portland, so I'm within walking distance of downtown Portland. And wow, it's, great. It's a great place to eat food. And so, and two of my children, I mentioned my daughter lives here with her two children. And my son, who's a computer programmer who lived in Dallas, Texas for 10 years, he moved to Portland this past summer. Oh, okay. And, this sounds like so, get, Okay, go ahead. He lives one mile away from me and he has a four year old. So, uh, it's really a very family oriented. I do lots of activities with family. Good. Are you, uh, are, we, are you doing any? Are you affiliated with any institution? Are you doing continuing on any, like an adjunct or anything of that sort? Or well, or well no? actually, I'm, I'm quite busy. In fact, what I've been doing this morning is um, one of the things that happened three years ago while I was at Purdue is I co-founded a company. Oh, while you were at Purdue? Yeah, right. Okay. And it was based on technology we developed at Purdue. Uh huh. Okay. And the company is called Cofiron, C-O-F-E-R-O-N. C-O-F-E-R-O-N? That's it, Uh O-N, Cofiron. And uh, so that company is is developing new types of drugs uh, based on some of the concepts of nanotechnology. And so it's gotten funding and has um, gained a life of its own. So it has a CEO and it has a chief scientific officer and people working for it. And so after I left Purdue, then I just signed on as a consultant. Oh, okay. But uh, I'm probably spending about 20 hours a week uh, doing drug design. Sure. Same sort of thing I was doing while I was Purdue. So in a sense, I haven't really retired. I'm no. still active. Absolutely. But I, I have much more control over my time now than I did uh, for two. I hear you. That's right. Is it located here in West Lafayette? Oh, uh, the, the company comp- is actually, uh, the first CEO actually was in Indianapolis. But oh, I see. The company now is, lo- is now located uh, in New York. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Because the other collaborators and founders and the chief scientific officer and the CEO all live in New York. Okay. Well, that, that gives you a uh, chance to visit the, the, the Big Apple. It, it does, and uh, because we can do most things by computer sure. and conference calls, in fact, I have a conference call coming up in an hour and a half okay. with the people. We, we, I'm engaged in two conference calls a week where we spend a couple hours each call going over our technology. Very good. Okay. I think that brings the list. Is there something I forgot, or I'll let, leave it up to you if you'd like to make any closing comments or something, as I said, I may have forgotten to ask? I think we've covered quite a bit of ground. Okay. Well, it's, uh, it's been very nice chatting with you, and I appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to log off, and I want to make a comment, and I'll just take off the recorder. So wait a second, okay?